are linear rails a worthwhile upgrade or just a waste of money? This seems to be a pretty controversial topic among the 3D printing community. Those in support of linear rails claim that they bring a higher print quality while enabling faster and quieter printing, all while reducing maintenance. I'll be taking an evidence-based approach to answer the question, are linear rails a worthwhile upgrade or are they just a waste of time and money? Before we get into the installation, let's quickly talk about some of the experiments that I'll be running. I've come up with a few, some of them qualitative, others barely quantitative. On top of that, there's one other big test I'll be doing, which I don't think anyone has given enough consideration. I'll explain more once we start installing the linear rails. The first experiment is designed to determine if there are any gross changes in print quality. I'll be printing a few different models to determine if there's any difference between print quality before and after the upgrade. The second experiment is all about resonance. If you haven't seen my video on Input Shaper, go ahead and check that out as it will make this experiment a lot more impactful. The quick and dirty of it is, is that we want our printers to be as rigid as possible so that they resonate at a single frequency. If we can get a really nice peaked frequency at one frequency, then we can just avoid creating that frequency. On the other hand, if we have resonance spread out across the entire spectrum, it's going to be a lot harder to compensate for without sacrificing print quality. I'll be taking resonance measurements on the X and Y axis for both the V-slot roller system and for the linear rail system so that we can determine if linear rails help us chase down that nice resonant peak. The third experiment is fairly practical, basically printer go fast. We're going to determine if linear rails are able to push our printer to higher speeds and accelerations. Basically, I've got a short snippet of G-code and I will run it over and over and over, increasing acceleration and increasing speed until the motor starts skipping steps. And that is what I will define as our mechanical limit. The fourth experiment might be kind of silly, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to throw in here. Basically, we'll be measuring the sound of the printer during travels and during printing to determine if linear rails make any difference to the noise of your printer. Now, the final experiment really isn't an experiment at all. Basically, I'll be experiencing the linear rails and trying to share with you what I think the differences are between maintaining linear rails and maintaining these slot wheels. So now that we've discussed the experiments, let's go ahead and jump into the actual installing of the linear rails. A few months back, I bought these linear rails from Amazon from a brand called Reliabot. I paid $23 per rail and got five MGN12H 350mm long linear rails. They came packed in bubble wrap, appearing undamaged. Some moved better than others, but they all seemed reasonable. Next, I moved the carriages along the rails one at a time to determine which ones moved the best. These two are definitely the best. I reserved the smoothest rail for my x-axis, which I will be installing in a future project. The worst two I reserved for my z-axis, again, a future project. And the leftover two are what I installed on the y-axis in this video. The first thing I did was clean the linear rails with 99% isopropyl alcohol. I did this to remove the grease that's on the rails when it comes from the factory. I think they put this on to help prevent corrosion of the rails themselves, but this kind of grease doesn't help our carriages move more smoothly. It's at this point when you should lubricate your linear rails. I, as I do so well, forgot to do this until I mounted everything, and I really regretted it. I started by adding grease directly to the linear rails, but then I watched this video by Andrew Esquivel. He used a syringe to inject grease directly into the reservoirs on the side of the carriages. This seemed like a smart idea, so I decided to follow suit. Now let's pretend at this point I've now perfectly prepped the linear rails. Now it's time to disassemble the bed. Removing one or two wheels and undoing the belt tensioner allowed me to remove the bed from the profile. So finally, after lots of preparation, it was time to install the linear rails. It should be straightforward, right? Right? So for some reason, Anycubic decided to make the V-slot profiles along their Y-axis different than every other V-slot on the printer. Literally every single other V-slot on the printer fits these P-slot nuts, except for the one that I need. This resulted in me sitting on the floor for a few hours grinding down these nuts. This resulted in me sitting on the floor for a few hours, grinding down these nuts by hand, just so that they might barely possibly fit into this 
weird V slot profile. Anyway, I just did four T slot nuts for each rail. I decided that one at each end to define the position of the rail would be great, and then just two towards the middle to help secure it to the profile. Since I ignored the recommended length of the linear rails for my specific printer, my rails just barely fit. Like they're butted right against the end stop and the belt tension. I couldn't believe how close it was. This probably affected how well that I could position the linear rails, but hey, I got a little extra range of motion out of it, right? So after getting all that done and out of the way, it was finally time to mount the bed. Wait, how do I mount the bed? Son of a b I totally forgot. I need mounts to mount the bed to the linear rail carriages. When I was confronted with this fact of life, of course, much earlier in the planning of this video, I got to thinking, can I 3D print my own mounts? What filament should I use? Will they be strong enough? Are they gonna warp over time? Luckily, around that same time, PCBWay had reached out to me and offered me a small budget to use with their 3D manufacturing services. So again, as I do, I got to thinking, and I realized that with PCBWay's help, I could run another really cool experiment. What if I investigated how different materials that your mount could be made of change the actual outcome of your linear rails being mounted? So now I have nine sets of mounts all made from different materials. The first four sets I printed at home myself. They are made of PETG and ASA, but for each of those I have a set which is printed with 15% infill and a set that's printed with 100% infill for both PETG and ASA. I chose these two materials because these are probably the most common ones people can print at home and use for structural parts. The reason I decided to do two different infills when you would normally think, just do 100%, it's a structural part. I wanted to see how the different densities of the parts would change the resonance measurements. The five sets of mounts that PCBWay sent me are made from ABS, an exotic resin, polycarbonate, nylon, and aluminum. And yes, of course, I had the aluminum painted orange. The greatest color there is. Now, to be clear, PCBWay didn't sponsor this video. They just provided me these services. So I figured I would give my honest opinion about the actual parts that they sent me. Honestly, they're really cool. While the ABS and polycarbonate prints don't look that special, they just look like run-of-the-mill 3D printed parts, both the nylon and resin don't even look 3D printed, and they look really cool. For the aluminum, the paint came off anytime it was scratched easily, but the dimensions of all these parts were spot on. In future projects, if I need more aluminum parts or some kind of special strong plastic that I can't make myself, I'll definitely look into PCBWay. So, shout out to them for making this experiment possible. Anyways, back to the mounting. Once I got the bed mounted to the linear rail carriages, I realized I couldn't activate the end stop because I used a longer linear rail than I should have. So I had to throw a part together real quick in Fusion 360 and I printed it out on my proof submit. So once everything was together, I did some test movements and everything looked like it was working. I ran a few bed meshes to kind of determine how off the linear rails were. I did that a few times and made some adjustments to the rails until everything moved pretty well. So for each material, this was the workflow. I would mount the material, take resonance measurements, take a bed mesh at 60 Celsius, calibrate the first layer, take a bed mesh at 80 Celsius, do a approximately two hour PETG print, and then take another 80 Celsius bed mesh. This workflow allowed me to take resonance measurements for every single mount of different materials. It allowed me to calibrate the printer the same time every way to ensure a relatively consistent mechanical setup. And finally, the 80 Celsius bed mesh print, and then again bed mesh. This allowed me to see if the parts were deforming or shifting at all during the prints. So while that was 10 or 15 seconds for you, that was a whole week of work for me, trying to fit prints in before and after work, trying to get mounts in. It was a lot. So if you appreciate all that work and think it's kind of interesting, maybe hit that like button. I don't know. So let's take a look at the results, starting with the bed meshes. Now, the only two materials that had some appreciable change in the bed mesh before and after the two hour PETG print were PETG15 and the aluminum. Now I imagine the PETG15 actually did have some deformation. I remember going to touch it and it was worn to the touch, which was odd because none of the other parts except for the aluminum were worn to the touch. 
maybe PETG just conducts heat better. For the aluminum, I think I just didn't have screws tightened all the way because with the plastics, when you tighten them, the plastic compresses. But with aluminum, it doesn't really compress. What happens is the screws stretch out, which requires some extra tightening than I had been doing. Retrospectively, this wasn't the most interesting experiment, but I couldn't think of another way to determine if the parts had deformed before and after a print. Also, it was only two hours of printing, not weeks and months of printing, so I can't really extrapolate out to that time frame. Next, we'll take a quick look at deflection. By deflection, I mean how much the bed shifted up and down when I applied some torque to it. As you may have predicted, PETG was the only material that really had some amount of give to it. Besides that, it seemed like all the deflection came from my Y-axis being mounted just in the middle to the printer. So why did I even consider PETG as a material? It deforms at lower temperatures, it's not as rigid as the other materials. Why did I even try a 15% model? Well, I wanted to see if it affected the resonance of the printer at all. Would a less rigid part actually dampen resonances? Luckily, we can find that out. In looking at the resonance graphs, it seems that the PETG with 100% infill outperformed the PETG with 15% infill. The main peak had a higher resonance value, and it seemed like the noisier resonances around that peak were more dampened for the 100% infill. For ASA, while the 100% infill had a higher main peak than the 15% infill, it doesn't seem like it really dampened any of those other frequencies around it. This leads me to believe that PETG being less rigid actually does dampen some of the frequencies. But why didn't 15% do a better job? I don't know. Maybe a part being just rigid enough and just flexible enough allows optimal dampening of those oscillations. This topic of making your printer super rigid and also trying to dampen these resonances is super interesting to me. If you'd like to see some future videos about it, make sure to let me know down in the comments. Looking across the different materials, the resonances of the x-axis really didn't change much. With the more rigid materials, it seems like the maximum of the main peak of the resonance graphs approached 1.6 times 10 to the 4. Resonance, resonance. Blah, blah, blah. So before we dive right into it, let me tell you what I'm looking for when I'm looking at these resonance graphs. Personally, I'm looking for a well-behaved resonance spectrum. And what I mean by well-behaved peak is something like this on the x-axis. We've got a really sharp peak, and that's it. That's kind of all we want. Ign ignore this. When it comes to the y-axis, you can see that we have one of those sharp peaks up here, but there's all this kind of contamination, for lack of a better word. We really don't want to see that. So the lower in amplitude that all the rest of these frequencies are, the less of a problem they will be for us. As you can see, in this case, the ZV input shaper, this blue dotted line right here, kind of perfectly is like a perfect inverse of this peak. And this can change like how wide its gaps are, how big its hills are and stuff, but it's not able to perfectly you know, cancel out something like this, where, see, it's kind of towards the middle of this whole peak. It's treating this like one whole peak, and it's right in the middle of that. So it's really not doing the best job. And just looking at some of the numbers, for instance, you can see that with this input shaper, we'll have a very low vibration and not too crazy of smoothing. But over here on the y-axis, we have a lot more vibration and a bit more smoothing. Now, once we go from PETG15 to PETG100, you can see that these peaks are definitely a lot lower um, value-wise. These peaked out at around 2.0, um, with some being scattered around 1.4-ish. Over here, they're all below that 2 mark that the last one peaked at. So these are all below 1.5. And this main peak is a lot higher. So what I'm looking for in a material is for these to be reduced as much as possible and for a really sharp peak. As you can see for ASA 15, we do not have a well-behaved peak at all on the y-axis. Now from ASA 100 and on, you'll notice that the x-axis, the secondary peak, is a lot bigger than um, it has been in the past uh, graphs. Basically, I stopped unloading the filament before doing these resonance tests, and that created something that could vibrate at approximately this frequency. Um, so just ignore that for the rest of these graphs. We're still focused on the y-axis, and as you can see, from 15 to 100, while we do have a higher main peak, um, our, our noisier spectrum peaks at around 1.5 for 15% infill, 
but for 100% infill, we are still at that 1.5 region, so these don't get any better. And in fact, it seems like they might even spread out a tad more. And it looks like we have maybe a loose bolt or something here that's causing this small um, frequency bump. Moving on to ABS, a fairly rigid material. We still have these noisy bits and they're actually peaking at around 2.0 now, which is not so great, um, but our main peak is taller for ABS. I assume because it's more rigid than ASA, but again, not super well behaved and we still have that loose bolt or something. So this one was really not so good. So as you can see, this main peak is actually a lot lower. So this lower peak is nice and it clearly had an effect on our maximum acceleration and how much smoothing there is. Um, but yeah, this spectrum is just very noisy and not well behaved at all. On to the resin. Um, this was a super rigid material. Um, and actually, it appears that the spectrum is a, a tad more well-behaved than the rest. We can see these frequencies in between the two larger peaks are not as prevalent as they have been in the, in the last ones. You can see there's just a lot more spacing between these. Yeah, this dips a lot lower. So that's a good sign, and that kind of supports our idea that more rigid is better. So now we're on to PA or nylon, kind of a similar spectrum to polycarbonate. Two pretty large peaks, nothing too crazy here. But again, it does seem a bit less noisy in terms of like how widespread these peaks are as compared to like the ASA and ABS. So nylon seems okay. Now, this is aluminum. This is our most rigid part, our least plastic part, obviously. It's got a, a peak of about 2.0, so a bit lower than the rest of them but you can see that the spectrum is a lot less noisy. Whereas this secondary peak was at 1.5, for aluminum, it is down at 0.5. It's still not like the most well-behaved peak and there's plenty of noise everywhere, especially in this, um, these latter parts of the spectrum. And this could be things like my, my webcam that are sitting not rigidly attached to the printer. It could be just stuff laying on the shelf that this printer is on. So I'm not so worried about those smaller things. So now that we've looked at each material, which one did I determine was the best for my setup? I ended up going with the aluminum mount. Half of that decision was based on the idea that a more rigid printer is what we're going for. The other half of that decision was based on the actual resonance graphs. They appeared to be a lot more well behaved around that main peak for the aluminum mount. And so finally, after adjusting the aluminum, after I decided that this is the one I was going to go with, this is the final resonance spectrum for that. You can see it's a tad more well behaved out here and um, still pretty much about the same out here. So yeah, this is the final spectrum that I thought was the best out of the lot. I'm going to go ahead and swap through all of the different resonance graphs so that you can view them at your leisure. So now that the material is decided, it's time to complete the rest of our experiments to determine if linear rails are worth it or not. Let's start by taking a look at the quality experiment. I printed out a Squirtle and a Tolerance test in light blue silk PLA. I printed out a Snorlax and another Tolerance test in Prusa Mint Pearl Mouse PLA. And finally, I printed out a complete printer test print in Prusa Mint Army Green PLA. A lot of time and even a lot of filament goes into these projects, so if you appreciate them, make sure to support the channel. In taking a closer look at the prints before and after the linear rail upgrade, the only thing I could really point out, and this might be my imagination, is that the oscillations on the prints after the linear rails were installed seem to be more well behaved and less random. I'm not sure if that's a result of the range of motion being more well defined, if it is the printer being more rigid and those resonances just being more well behaved, or if I'm just seeing things and need glasses soon. Besides those oscillations being a little more well defined, there weren't any other visual cues that pointed towards linear rails being better than B-slot wheels. Now for the tolerance tests, there also weren't any conclusive results. It seemed like for the linear rail test, there was a little more give in the tolerance tests, but Again, that could just be chance, fluke, whatever. So take it with a grain of salt. I wish I could offer results that are a lot less qualitative than the ones I've just presented. So if you have ideas on how to determine print quality better, let me know down in the comments. 
So now let's take another look at the resonance graphs for the V-slot and the linear rails before now. The X-axis is maximum spectral power increased by about 50%, while the Y-axis had an increase of almost 175%. It appears that for the y-axis, the linear rails made the spectrum a lot more well-behaved, and the main peak has a smaller full width half max. If you look at the ZV input shaper, the dotted blue line, you can see how much better it lines up with the linear rail peak than it does the V-slot. The final bit of data I have for this experiment is the vibration percentage of the ZV input shaper. As you can see for the x-axis, it didn't change very much, especially because of the, the filament contamination. But you can see for the y-axis that for our aluminum part, we get the lowest vibration value when we use that ZV input shaper, which is another indicator that made me choose aluminum. Overall, I would say that linear rails are the overall winner of the resonance test. All right. Now, when it came to the speed and acceleration experiment, I was honestly taken by surprise. But first, let me tell you how I ran this experiment in a little more detail. I got this snippet of G-code from LS3DP, which basically has the printer do these patterned movements, some large and then some small. I repeated this G-code over and over with higher and higher accelerations until I found the maximum before the printer started skipping steps. After I determined the maximum acceleration I could reach, I then repeated this G-code increasing the speed over and over until I found the maximum speed. And this is what determined the maximum mechanical limits of my printer. So for the V-slot system, I managed to get a maximum acceleration of 11,400 millimeters per second squared. And with this acceleration, I managed to reach a top speed of 800 millimeters per second, which was kind of crazy. Even crazier is this. I tested the acceleration for the linear rails and I reached a maximum of 24,000 millimeters per second squared. That's over twice the acceleration that the V-slot wheels had. But again, even crazier, once I started to increase the speed at all past 400 millimeters per second, steps skipping all over the place. No matter what I did, I couldn't get the linear rails moving past 400 millimeters per second. So what I decided to do was set the acceleration for the linear rails to be the same as the V-slot wheels, 11,400, and then increase the speed over and over until I get a maximum. And I figured that maximum speed will be higher than the V-slot wheels. Boy, was I wrong. I only reached a maximum speed of 750 millimeters per second with the linear rails at the same acceleration as the V-slot system. Now, I found these results to be kind of mind-boggling, but we'll get into discussing that in just a minute. First, let's go ahead and move on to the noise experiment. So I got this app on my phone that allows me to measure how loud the sound is around it. I set up my phone's microphone two feet back from my printer's bed at around the same height, and I recorded how loud the printer was during a few travels on the y-axis and during the printing of the Squirtle model. The travels were reproduced by writing a quick G-code macro, which had the printer start at 20 millimeters per second, moving all the way down and all the way back. And then it would do that in increments of 20 millimeters per second, all the way up to 400 millimeters per second. Here's a few of the before and after sound measurements for the travels. Here's the comparison of the overall noise of the printer before and after the linear rail upgrade. Overall, I would argue that noise should not be a reason for advocating for linear rail upgrades. Honestly, the things like motor noise and your fans make so much more of a difference that it's not even worth considering the, the rails. Before we get into the final discussion about all these results, let's quickly talk about the maintenance. These slot wheels degrade over time just from the friction of them moving along the profile. You end up having to replace them over time, 
but you can replace them with polycarbonate wheels which last longer. The worst part about the V-slot wheels in my opinion is that you have to tighten them just right so that they're strong enough to hold on to the profile but not too strong that there's extra friction. Linear rails on the other hand, once you set them up, you don't really have to think about them. Sure you have to re-grease them every once in a while but that's really not that big of a deal. While they are more consistent over time, I will say the initial setup is a lot of work. If you want to do it properly. Which I don't think I did. So let's talk about the overall result of this investigation. While I did my very best to maintain the efficacy of all of these experiments, they're not the best experiments and I can't directly point towards differences in the results that point towards linear rails being better than V-slot wheels. The biggest differences that I see between the linear rails and the V-slot wheels are that the resonances were much better on the linear rails and I think over time as I continue to update my printer to make it more rigid with more linear rails etc etc that all those will start to sum up and make a really quality printer. I do think that a lot of the results in this video are skewed not in linear rails favor because I've never set up linear rails before. I don't know how to do it perfectly, I don't know how to clean them properly, degrease them perfectly, so that's something to consider. I will say the beauty of that fact though is that I don't think most people do. So if most people are going to install these linear rails, they might encounter these issues and this is the quality that they can expect. I mean, I did lots of research and preparation for this video, so what does that tell you? But maybe I'm just dumb. So taking an objective look at all of the results from these experiments, I tried asking myself, would you spend $80 for these linear rails and the supplies needed to install them if you weren't making a YouTube video about it? Now the answer I gave was probably yes. The thing is though, I wouldn't have made the upgrade for the improved print quality, the speed, the resonance. I would have done it because I enjoy tinkering and learning and enjoying working with my printer. Maybe if you set up the linear rails perfectly and spent a longer time making sure they were dialed in, these results would be a lot different. But if either you're not interested in tinkering with your printer or you're not willing to put in that time to research and perfectly set up your rails, I don't recommend them. I think that they are a waste of time and money. If you want better print quality, faster print times, just save up for a new printer. Now if you do enjoy tinkering with your printer and you want to learn how to set up linear rails perfectly, I'm going to be looking deeper into this, trying to figure out how to get them dialed in the best, how to clean them the best, how to grease them the best. I'll be looking into that in a future video, so if you're interested in that, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Now if you made it this far into the video, thank you so, so much for your support. I've been real busy the last few months, luckily, all of it positive, except for a board exam I had to study for, that was stressful. But now that all that is over, I'm really working to try and publish one video a month from now on on the channel. So if I can make that happen, then I will see you in about a month in the next video. By the way, if you think your part cooling is really good, check out this video because it might actually still suck. Anyways, again, thank you for watching, I've been Spencer, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye!